All right, welcome everyone to another virtual shadowing session at Hearts for Health today. It's so Thursday, hope all of y'all are having a good week so far, almost the beginning of school. So this is one of the last summer shadowing sessions that we'll have, but we'll be continuing later on in the fall. Today, we're joined by Dr. Grossman. He's a Sackler School of Medicine graduate um, and has founded the Homeless Project Tel Aviv. It took first place from the Social Justice Project and Paper. He is now a MedPeds resident. He's going to be talking about the specialty. Um, it's a pretty unique specialty. We've seen primary care and internal medicine already. We've seen pediatrics, but seeing MedPeds is something that's new to virtual shadowing with us. So we're excited for that today. As a few reminders for those who might be new and just listening in, towards the end of each of these shadowing sessions, we have around 15 to 20 minutes of a Q&A. So if you have any questions for Dr. Grossman, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll be able to get to them during that time at the very end. For those who wanna stay tuned with more shadowing sessions, we go on a roughly Monday to Thursday, to, yeah, Monday to Thursday schedule. Around 7 p.m. Central is when we start. And to stay tuned with each of those sessions and who's gonna be speaking, you can either follow us on Instagram where we make posts and flyers um, for those shadowing sessions ahead of time. Or we also have our listserv, which is much of the same thing but just over email, we have a weekly email and we'll send out the shadowing sessions for the upcoming week. To subscribe to our listserv, you can either do that through subscribing on our website. We have a subscription form at the bottom of each page, or you can email us at our email, which is shadowing, period H, the number four H at gmail.com. And just ask to be added to our listserv. Please include your name and email. We'll be able to add you on. But outside of that, that's all the reminders I have. If you have any questions for us outside of what I mentioned, feel free to contact us. Uh, but I don't want to take up too much time. So Dr. Grossman, feel free to take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. So thanks to uh, Michael and Mary for setting this up. Thanks to Hearts for Health for setting this up. Honored to be here. Um, I just finished a 12-hour shift. So excuse my eyes sagging because I am very tired, but very excited to be here nonetheless. So uh, Michael gave a pretty good introduction. I can't really top that. Clearly, he's very well read in my background. Um, but yeah, so I'm originally from California. I uh, went to undergrad at the University of California in Irvine. I got a biology degree. Um, and then I was like, this is too hard. And then I switched to psychology. And then I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do psychology. So I switched back to biology. And then I missed the psychology. So I ended up getting um, a double major in biology and psychology from there. Then I took a year off, did some tutoring, did some research, volunteering, and I applied to medical school. And I applied to medical schools all across the U.S. and a few internationally, and I ended up getting into this one called the Sackler School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University in Israel. And they told me I could come in a month rather than wait a year. So I said, yeah, why not? Let's do it. So I went, had an amazing time, was there for four years. And then um, I applied to residency, which is kind of where you're a doctor, uh, but you're working under the auspices of a professional long-term doctor. Um, and so I'm just finishing that up now, my fourth year. Um, and currently I'm applying to another field after this, a fellowship, they call it, in pulmonary medicine and critical care. So it's kind of like ICU medicine, ventilators, bronchoscopy. So if you've heard of a colonoscopy, I, you would do that through the lungs, looking at different parts of the lung and a bunch of other fun stuff like that. So um, that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, I want today really to be about you guys and gals. I don't feel, I listen to myself talk all day, so I don't want to talk too much, but um, yeah, you know, I'll start out by saying that I wasn't a super strong uh, student or medical student. I was never top of my class. Um, so I, a big advocator for people who are not naturally smart and they really want to be a doctor. And I tell them that they can do it. you got to try. And, uh, if you don't make it, you don't hit the grades, then at least you tried. Otherwise you'll always wonder. Uh, and there's a lot of amazing fields out there. Being a doctor is not the only one where you can make a difference in the world. Um, I always think that in another life I would open a dog shelter and, just work with dogs all the time. So um, being where I am now, I can say that and you can trust me in saying that, that I think that there's a lot of other things in the world where you can do a lot more good for the world than, than just being a doctor. Um, 
So like any advice I give today uh, will probably be based on my experiences in medical school and residency and kind of my path, but um, I'm free, happy to talk about NP school, PA school, um, certain techs like lab techs, or um, if you want to be a uh, ultrasound technologist, or if you want to be an EKG tech, uh, or they call it a teletech, um, you can ask me about, you know, whatever you want to. So um, ask questions. Let me get some questions. And I know it's early, Michael, but um, today is all about, I just like want to answer your questions and I can talk a lot about each question and expand on them. So if you have any, now's the time. Yeah. Well, while we wait for the questions to roll in, maybe I can throw out some that are just generalized, a little broad in questions. And if students have some specific questions, feel free for uh, everyone to ask. I wanted to start off with the specialty. Why did you choose internal medicine and pediatrics? Were there any other specialties that you had in mind when applying? Um, yeah, so I actually originally applied mostly to family medicine, um, which is essentially an outpatient field. And I was all about family. I, I shadowed a family medical doctor when I was... Um, uh, a pre-med. And, um, that was like my main kind of goal, you know, in, in family med, you can do a little bit of OB-GYN, which is like delivering babies, gynecology. You can do a little bit of like kind of hands-on surgery, a little bit of ER type of medicine, a little bit of orthopedics, casting, kind of general outpatient stuff, adults and kids. But I learned about med peds, which kind of in my later years in med school, which was mostly about um, more inpatient medicine and family medicine kind of deals with a lot of things. And, uh, med peds kind of just focuses in on the adults and the kids, which is really what I was interested. In. I wasn't really interested in the obstetrics and the gynecology, the surgery, the ER it wasn't really for me. And I also like the fact that with med peds, um, it combined a total of six years into four. It's kind of like a fun accelerated program. So normally if you do internal medicine, which is like adult medicine is three years. And if you do pediatric medicine, it's three years. Um, but with med peds, they combine it and you just do it in, in a nice four years. So it's kind of uh, fun and fast paced. And um, uh, if I had known how hard it was, I probably would have never done it. But here I am, I guess I made it. And um, it's a really fun field uh, in the sense that you can work with so many age groups, feel comfortable treating those age groups. Um, and um, you're really versatile in the fact that you can work in pretty much any setting and feel like you know what you're doing, which is pretty cool to say. Um, and then more so than that, you can go on to do a fellowship, kind of like what I'm doing. People, some people choose to do a combined fellowship with adults and kids, do another four or five years, which is a long time. Some decide to just go to peds, go to medicine. Some decide to just do med peds, do general outpatient, do general inpatient care, which is in the hospital. So there's a lot of fun options that you can, that you can do. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I'm doing adult pulmonary, which is uh, the lungs and adult critical care. So it's another combined specialty. Um, clearly I have a uh, problem uh, making decisions in my life uh, because I did bio and psych, I did med and peds, and now I'm doing pulmon crit. So don't follow my path, think about things, figure out what you wanna do, try to pick one if you can. But um, you know, I, I wouldn't change my path at all. I really enjoyed uh, every aspect of the field. Um, and I'm happy to talk freely about it if there are questions. Definitely, there's some questions that rolled in. The first being about extracurriculars. Extracurriculars are always diverse for everyone because they always have their own assortment of activities. For you, what do those look like during your undergraduate years? Um, so today we're looking at a extracurriculars. Uh, oh, so like when I was in, like when you're in medical, like um, undergrad or high school or in undergrad. Undergrad. Okay. Yeah. So I would say that, um, probably, I mean, there's, there's the generic. So I've been out of the game for a while now, but at least when I was in school, the big things were volunteering is really important, uh, and exposure to the medical field and not only for your application, but you need to like go out there and really see what you're signing up for. Cause a lot of people like watch house or Grey's Anatomy, or The Good Doctor, or some shows like that, or Scrubs, and they're like, I want to be a doctor. That's what I did. But I really didn't know what I was signing up for. Thank God I actually ended up liking it. But um, you really should know what you're signing up for. So 
what I recommend people to do is not sign up for one of those Joe Schmo programs where you volunteer, you're like a candy striper. I would really go in there, uh, email some doctors, call some local offices and ask what um, about me just coming in and shadowing you? Is that okay? And you'd be surprised. A lot of doctors will help you and they'll say, yeah. Um, so reach out to your local doctors, whatever you're interested in, and just, just go off of that. So if you want to shadow a neurosurgeon, go shadow a neurosurgeon, go see what they're doing. Cause maybe you won't like it. Maybe it's not what you're into. And then maybe the next week you'll try to shadow a gynecologist. Oh, I love this. I love delivering babies. I love the uterus and the ovaries and the anatomy. It's so interesting. So maybe that's what you're all about. So just do your research, know what you're signing up for. A lot of people just don't know. Um, so that's one thing, volunteering, do whatever you want, whether it's like, you know, volunteering at a dog shelter, um, any other charity, um, homeless shelter, soup kitchen, but do something that's like long-term. And then when you're in college, if you can try to get into a research project, try to get into a lab, into something that you're interested in. I was in interested in like psychiatry. So I got into like an ADHD lab. Um, I didn't end up publishing anything, but I was in the lab and it was an experience I could talk about. So you just want to do something that shows that you're interested and you can expose yourself. We have a few more questions that rolled in. I'll just go through them by order. The next one is a student asking, is 28 years old too late to apply to medical school? Um, no, it's not. Just make sure that recently you've done a lot of medical school related things to make your application look good. If it's been like, if you did a bio degree 10 years ago and you expect to get into medical school now, 10 years later, um, you, you can't do that. You have to start doing stuff now. So if you've been out of school for a while, maybe get into a master's program or a post back program, something, you have to show some sort of education, I would say. I'm not the authority on this, but I would recommend doing that. Um, I have an Instagram. Um, you can message me your private questions if it's like very specific to you. It's Jeremy Grossman underscore. So I think my name is on here. J-E-R-E-M-Y-G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N underscore. So if you have specific questions about your case, I'm happy to answer it. Um, but um, yeah, it's not too late. It's not too late at all. You should shoot for the stars, okay? Definitely. I think the main theme being that you need to stay updated with what's going on in terms of prereqs, like you said, and all. Um, the next question is about, you mentioned earlier, you attended an international medical school before going back to the US for residency. What compelled you to apply? And was it a hard time moving so far away? Or do you already have family at the location in Israel? Good question, good question. Um, I didn't have family there. Um, I had been there once on a trip and I loved it and I had heard good things about the program and I'd seen their match list. So whatever program you apply to, you should look at their match list. A match list shows you where students have gone uh, from that program um, and the percentage of students that match into a residency program at all. Because you could be a doctor and get your MD, but you can't work as a doctor, at least clinically with patients, if you don't do a residency. So make sure that the place you apply to has that. Um, I would say, generally speaking, apply to U.S. schools, um, U.S. MD schools. DO schools also do very well in the U.S. Um, but I would rank, as far as in my experience, D U.S. DO and U.S. International roughly in the same realm. Uh, I think they do equally well um, and they're equally respected. And at the end of the day, you're a doctor and you can practice just like anybody else. Um, the, uh, president's doctor right now in DC, I believe is a DO actually. So, um, it doesn't matter where you trained. Uh, it just matters what kind of a doctor you are and, um, you care about your patients and you've shown progression in your career that you want to do good and make a difference. And, um, you know, that you're trustworthy. So that's what I would say. Um, in regards to applying abroad, um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be an adjustment. Sometimes know where you're applying. If there's a language barrier, you might have to know your languages. Luckily in Israel, most people spoke English. So it was okay. I did learn Hebrew for the benefit of my patients when I was there. Um, there's a lot of good schools in the Caribbean, like St. George's, AUC, AUA, Ross, um, a lot of good schools that place pretty well in the U.S. So look up those schools. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of forums on that online you can read into. 
I have a lot of good friends who went to those schools. They're doing well and they're with me in my program now. Um, and those are all primarily English speaking. You do your first two years in the Caribbean and then your second two years in the state. So it's not too bad. You just kind of do your in-classroom work the first two years and then you do your school work or rather your clinical work in the hospital back in the state. So it's a pretty good deal. Another student asks on the same topic, if you do go to an international medical school, are you still certified to practice in the US or do you need to get certification, recertification once you are back in the US? Good question. So you need to apply for a special certificate, but um, the only thing that matters is you have to do your residency in the US. So if you've already done your residency in another country, you'll have to repeat it here. But usually, as long as the school is recognized internationally within the US as a medical school that's certified, you're good to go. Um, most, I would say for the most part, most medical schools are, but just be sure that before you go to a school that it is recognized by the United States as a medical school. You said earlier, you are not the greatest student in college. So a student asks, if you are comfortable with sharing, do you mind sharing your cumulative GPA, your science GPA and MCAT? <laughs> uh, I mean, I have no issue. Yeah, so I took the old MCAT. So I don't know how much that'll help you guys out. Um, I was probably like a three, five GPA in, med in uh, undergrad. I was a, which is okay, which is fine. I think you really should be at a three, six and above to be competitive. And then um, I was a 30 on my MCAT. And then later, I believe I was a 509 on the new MCAT, something like that, or a 512, something like that. And then, um, uh, was that it? GPA, MCAT, that's it, right? Anything else? Yeah, GPA, MCAT, that was all that they asked okay. for. Yeah, so there you go. Hopefully that answers your question. But it's case by case. I mean, you can't, it's not really set. I would like try to be as close to the like requested values. I think there's a website called Frida, R-F-R-E-I-D-A that gives you like average grades of acceptance at certain medical schools. Take a look at those. Try to be within like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of that uh, when you apply. But more so they're trying to like get more like well-rounded students. So it's not just the GPA anymore. It's like, they wanna see that you've done stuff too. Cause um, you could be the smartest person in the world but you're not, you don't know how to talk to people. You don't, haven't had any life experience. So how can they trust you with their lives if you don't know what the meaning of living really is, you know? Speaking of that, medical school will only see you on paper really with your personal statement and then the numbers obviously your GPA and MCAT in the application phase but later on in the interview what kind of prep do you recommend whether it be for medical school or residency I'm sure there's things that overlap in terms of the advice you could give between either I don't understand what so like studying like what resources as in so there's multiple forms nowadays there's multiple forms of interview that they now hold like one-on-one, -on -one, small group. Um, so in your case, I'm, I'm not sure if it was different back then, if they just did a certain format, but what did you use to prep for interviews ahead of? For interview? I mean, I, I don't think med school is necessarily different. It's a, it's a job at the end of the day. So they're gonna ask you those questions like, what would you do if a patient was yelling at you, but you were trying to do your best to save them? Or what would you do if a, uh, you were trying to give a, let's say like BiPAP therapy to a patient and the brother of the patient was like swatting the BiPAP away, uh, which was trying to save the patient. How would you respond to that? What would you do? Uh, what have you done? And what's a tough situation you've had? So you just look up like normal interview questions. And um, that's one thing I would say know why you're applying to medical school, have a good story, even if it's not hundred percent real, Make sure that it sounds good and real, you know? Uh, I'm a type one diabetic, so I just kind of rode with that, which was a really the main reason I did apply, but I you know, embellished it a little bit, made it sound a little, um, I don't know, shinier. So just practice your interview skills. You can have somebody ask you interview questions. Um, there's like YouTube videos where you can like practice with somebody as well. They'll ask a question, you'll pause it, and it'll be like you're staring at them. Um, yeah, if I didn't answer your question, feel free to, you know, reach out 
online and I can help you out, but I hope that helped. Definitely, I think it did. Another student asks about your typical day now as you mentioned a fourth year resident, right? Mm. Fourth year, right? So what? how do you divide up your day between being at the, the hospital to now at home? How do you make time for yourself and all? That's a good question. I mean, I've made time for this after a 13 hour workday. So I don't know, you do the math, but I'll give you the, like the rundown of my day. So I usually wake up around 5 45, six. Um, uh, and I walk my dog Zeus, um, and feed him, brush my teeth, shower, whatever, et cetera. Give my girlfriend Liz a kiss. Then they leave the house. Then I um, drive to work about 30 minutes. I get there around seven o'clock and there's a night resident that watches my patients. We all rotate. So sometimes I'm the night resident, but the night resident watches my patients. They tell me what happened about my patients overnight. I say, thank you. They go home and sleep. Now I'm on, I go around on my patients. I determine plans of care for them. I review any new labs or imaging their vital signs. I see how they're feeling, how they're looking. Maybe I upgrade them to the ICU. Maybe I discharge them home because they're better. Maybe I downgrade them to a different floor. Maybe they're getting a surgery and I'm prepping them, whatever. So I do that throughout the day. Uh, around 12, I get lunch. And then 12 to five, I'm just kind of following up, catching up on stuff. Um, and then at seven, I sign out to the night resident again. And that's like an inpatient service. And an outpatient service is I basically go in at eight o'clock see a new patient every 15 to 20 minutes. And I do that until five o'clock at night, um, writing notes about these patients as well, ordering things for them, referring them to different centers. Um, that's pretty much the day of my life. So um, you get about as a resident, maybe one to two days off a week. It's probably more averaging one day off a week, sometimes two days off a week, but it's very difficult, um, but you get used to it. Like I'm really tired right now. I'm not on many hours of sleep but I'm used to just like being chronically tired and your body adapts and you learn how to do it. But, um, it's a tough struggle. It's a really, it's an uphill battle at first, but you learn how to adapt. Um, but yeah, you know, I, when I have tougher long days, like today, I'm not going to go to the gym when I'm on an easier eight to five service. Um, I will, um, go to the gym, uh, maybe spend time with my dog a little bit more, um, spend time with my girlfriend a little bit more, see friends, go out and get a drink, um, you know, as much as you can, but uh, you take it day by day and you try the best you can and you make sacrifices. There's a lot of sacrifices. I was just talking about that the other day. Um, but it's really worth it. I mean, what you do is like really fulfilling and you really enjoy what you do and you make a big impact in people's lives. And, you know, um, you kind of forget you, you sometimes you do it for so long and you're so drained and you kind of have to take a step back, which I'm actually doing right in the second and realizing, okay, I like made some people's lives better today. I made an impact today. So it kind of makes it all worth it. Um, but I'm still really tired. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think it did. It's, it's definitely understandable. Um, another student asks about undergrad would taking or would completing a degree in three years be a disadvantage heading into medical school or applying to medical school, I think is what they're referring to. If you can finish it in three years and get a good grade, no, I don't think so. Um, but I imagine in those three years, you're working the entire time. So if you're okay with missing out on college life and life outside of medicine, which often I still do, um, and that's okay. But I think it's really important to still experience life because sometimes one day you'll get to my age, 30 years old, and your whole life just passed you by and you've just been studying and working and I don't regret anything. And I've had fun experiences, but, you know, I see friends on Instagram and Facebook and they've done all sorts of things with their lives. And, um, you know, that's what you have to keep in mind too. You're, you're a human being and you should still enjoy and experience life to some degree because one day, you'll be a physician like me and all you do is get up and work all day. <laughs> so uh, just keep that in mind. I think that should be a big, I think people like don't put that high enough on their totem pole of importance and that they should, 
but um, no, I think it's fine if you do it in three years, if you're really smart, if you're one of those, nat- I, my brother's like a naturally smart person and he's able to just get stuff really quickly. And I'm sure it's much more tolerable for him. If I were to do that, I would be like burnt out and probably not getting good grades. Many of the students who are listening in are not in medical school yet. They're either taking a gap year or a post back, or they're still an undergrad. So one student asks about your experience having and attending. Has it been a smooth experience? Are there sometimes rough patches with having and attending supervising you as a resident and you're in a hectic setting, I'm sure. Um, And also, I think you already touched on this, but have the hours in residency created any difficulty in your personal life? If you have anything to add to that, feel free. I think you've touched on the sacrifice earlier. Um, so just like difficulty with my attending, is that kind of the main question? Yeah, just the general experience with an attending. How is it like, especially that in that many of the students listening in haven't had the experience to have someone like that in a setting like that because they're not residents yet? Yeah, I mean, I think 99% of the time attendings are good people who are going to the field because they want to teach, they want to help. They actually take a pay cut. If you work in like a private hospital and you don't teach, you can make like one and a half to two times more. So you have to realize these people like are really passionate about what they do and they care about teaching, but they are people too and they get burnt out. And um, I've had some real jerk attendings and uh, they really made my life miserable. But I'd say the vast majority of them have been really good to me and really understanding and caring and patient. Um, So yeah, I don't think that it's been tough they're like there to kind of mentor you and they care about you and I have a lot of good relationships and I was a bad resident initially I had really had a tough time initially and was always like brought into people's offices to say well you should be doing this you should be doing this so you know you can trust me when I say that I think people are very understanding Um, as far as like the difficulty created in my personal life yeah so like as I was I mean you miss out on a good amount of things but if you really care about it and you're okay with making a little bit of sacrifice in your time, you can, you know, make things happen, whether that's going out for a drink, whether that's traveling, whether that's seeing your family, generally speaking, you get a a month's worth of time off per year as a resident. So you can still see your family and visit them and still doable. But um, yeah, there's, there's a big sacrifice component. Um, But Do I think it's worth it? Yeah, I do think it's worth it, at least for me. Another student asked about difficulties, particularly in medical school. Outside of what you've already mentioned, is there anything else you want to add about that? Um, You know, it's funny. Like I felt that undergrad was more stressful because I was like trying to get into medical school and that like hurdle was like the biggest hurdle. So in medical school, it was actually like less stressful for me because I knew I was just trying to maintain where I was at rather than trying to like get through this wall of admission into a school. Um, But generally speaking, once you're in a medical school, there's a lot of protections in place to prevent you from failing out. And there's a lot of help. And um, if you've gotten to that point, you've usually been screened like intellectually someone has said this person based on what I'm seeing in their transcript and what they've done, they can tolerate a medical school curriculum. So I think um, um, it's not as bad. I think undergrad is more stressful because you just have so much pressure on you to like get into medical school. And I know friends of mine who really wanted to go to a USMD school and they like just got in like last year and they're my age. So like you know, going back to the 28 year old question, you can totally do it. Um, but, uh, it's up to you. I mean, do you want to just be volunteering and studying and trying to impress some U S med school faculty, or are you cool with just trying your hardest, maybe being good enough for an international school, busting your butt to get through that and then get into a medical residency and being a doctor either way. It's up to you. I don't know. I think ego plays a big part. I think a lot of us go into medicine because we have big egos Um, because you have to believe highly in yourself to believe that you can 
get through that long, vigorous, intense pathway to becoming a doctor and not only getting to become a doctor, but being a doctor. So you have to really think highly of yourself and you have to have some form of an ego to get through it. Um, so it's up to you. It's up to you what you want to do. So if I didn't answer your question, you know, reach out and I can try to answer it uh, more specifically for you. Yeah, I'll be, for those who are interested, I'll put uh, Dr. Grossman's handle in the chat. I did have another question. Earlier, I mentioned that you were the founder of the Homeless Project Tel Aviv. Can you tell us more about what that was, the inspiration behind it? Yeah, cool. Thanks for asking. Um, so I grew up pretty affluent. I think the majority of us going into medical school grow up, majority, not all, grow up in some form of affluence. They have some form of money to them and maybe privilege, you could call it because um, they're able to pay for studying, they're able to pay for extra resources, they're able to pay for applications, whatever. Um, and I always found it really difficult to think that people were living, you know, their lives without just basic access to like food and water and uh, shelter, etc. cetera. Um, so when I was in med school, I noticed there's a lot of homeless people in Tel Aviv and I it really kind of like, um, was heavy on my heart and I felt like there was something I could do like even like I wasn't a doctor yet so I couldn't treat them and help their medical problems I was like there's got to be something I can do and it goes back to what I was initially saying that you can't just wait for medical school and think you're going to make a big difference there's so many other ways in life you can make a big difference in people's lives you don't have to be a doctor so I created this um, organization the group of medical students to go out into Tel Aviv, um, into the city, into the more impoverished parts of the city, feeding, um, you know, homeless patients or people, or I should say, with um, with snacks and sandwiches, giving out waters, and most importantly, giving them resources to figure out if they need a place to stay, they can go here. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them have drug abuse problems, and a lot of these shelters don't take you if you abuse drugs or you drink. So, but. Um, I think it was good for the homeless population in the sense that they could get a little bit of food, a little water, maybe a resource, but it's probably more important for the medical students to be exposed to understand that there's this population there. And I think oftentimes we, a lot of people go into this field to make money and it's, I really don't recommend going into it for money because it's like really not that much. If you really want to make money, like go into business or tech or something, you can make plenty more money or real estate. Um, but a lot of people do. And they just think about how to get money from patients and they forget like this job is way more than that. So um, I think we made a good impact in people's lives and um, the program's still going today, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, four, five, seven years later, I should say. So that's kind of a cool thing. And uh, yeah, I, I took this prize in this, um, this like class I took, but that wasn't really the main aspect of it. The main aspect was just kind of doing it. So, um, and something you can put on your resume too. So you all have the capability of creating some charitable project or creating a project like Michael and Mary have now creating this hearts for health kind of organization. And they can put that on their applications and you all can put something on your applications. Now you can create it yourself, right? You can't, you can't create your own shadowing. You have to find that, but this is something you have control on and you can make a direct impact like right now. And there's only thing stopping you is you. And it really doesn't make that much organizing. If you want to like go, I don't know, volunteer at a dog shelter, you can just go do that. Go tomorrow. If you want to like, if you know that there's like a homeless population in your town, like make some sandwiches, just like go. You put that on your resume, game over, done. So you can make a big impact in your lives at like any age. And um, I think a lot of people limit themselves thinking about it, but uh, that's my answer to your question. Hopefully that answered it. Yeah. Another student asks about your number one tip for being successful in applying to medical school. In applying to medical school? In medical uh, school. Sorry about that. In medical school. Yeah. So to be successful during those medical school years, what's your number one tip? Know your resources, manage your time. I would say managing your time is important. I think most people who've gotten to medical school are smart enough to handle it, but a lot of people get sidetracked and they're on Instagram, people are going out, like, just know what you're going to do, organize your day, you can go out and have fun, that's fine, but just say, like, these two hours of each day, 
from 5 to 7 p.m. I am studying no matter what and stick to it and don't lie to yourself because if you lie to yourself, the system doesn't work. So just like set a calendar of what you're going to do. And I like to personally set out my calendars, like even like months in advance. But um, obviously, you know, life happens and things change. But start out with setting your week up. Each week on Saturday or Sunday, set up your entire week, Monday through Sunday, what you're going to be doing. And throughout like a semester or a quarter of classes, and you'll just know what you should be doing. Um, and if you stick to it, you should get a good grade. If you've covered all the material and you've covered it twice, three times, you should be good to go. Were you involved in research or do you feel like there was any distinctions in how involved you could be in research when you were in medical school over in Israel? Yeah, I mean, I published a paper when I was there, but I, I don't think they expect most people to publish. I think they just expect you to maybe get a poster out of it, pre present it at like a conference. Um, I think the most important thing is to show that you're interested in and that you committed to it. Not something that you were in for like three months and you like went to like once a month. It should be something that you've been in for a year plus uh, and that you've gone to and that you've produced something from a paper, an abstract, a poster, like something that you can show that you've done this work and somebody who can say and vouch for you, write a letter of rec saying they did research, they were trustworthy. And, you know, that's pretty much all you really need for research. I don't think that you need to publish to or put something out there big time that's going to define you. Looking back, what do you think you would have done differently in undergrad? Uh, honestly, I tried my, my hardest in undergrad. Um, I was um, socializing in college. I was kind of a geeky nerd in, in high school and I didn't do much. So I felt like I needed to make that up in college. And I probably was out socializing way more than I needed to. So I would have tried to limit that, but honestly, at the same time, I wouldn't have, cause you just got to live your life. Whatever you're feeling, you should do. Like life is so short. You get hit by a bus tomorrow. So you just got to enjoy your life, but also keep in mind your goals and try to balance the two um, by setting up a calendar. Just know when you're going to go out, when you're not going to go out. You know, if you think you're probably going to go out this weekend, talk to your friends on Monday and say, Friday night, we're going to go out from at seven, after seven. And then, you know, until 6.30, you're going to be studying. And from 6.30 to 7, you're going to be getting ready, showering, put some cologne on, and you're going to be going out. Um, yeah. When you were considering medical school, or I think maybe this might fit a bit better from residency since we haven't talked too much about it, mm -hmm. does location matter at all for you? Are you trying to target a specific area, demographic of patients in just in being aware that you want to deal with them later on or you want to see them later on as a practicing physician? That's hard to do. That's really hard to do. Um, I don't, I don't think you can predict that or even know that at any point in your career. Um, I guess if you want to do like rural medicine, you know, you want to be in like farm country that then you can maybe shoot for like more rural hospitals and medical schools. But generally speaking, most medical schools will give you, a full rounded education and patients are going to have mostly similar bread and butter diseases wherever you go. So, um, yeah, I think apply broadly and hope you get into at least one, unless you're like a superstar candidate, then pick from your, from Harvard and Yale, but that wasn't me. In residency, what are some examples of conditions, problems in general that you see patients dealing with day to day? Are there some common ones you see that end up being almost like a daily occurrence? Yeah. Um, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, sepsis, where you get like bacteria in your blood, um, upper respiratory problems, causing cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, needing oxygen, um, heart attacks, or things that are kind of like heart attacks. Those are like the big ones, but there's so much you could see and you always have to be open to all the things that you might see. Um, but uh, what I really like about medicine 
pediatric and adult medicine is you are the frontline doctor who determines what they have and you have to be open to everything. And I love that. Once you become a, into one specialty, you kind of box yourself in and you're just going to be dealing with that, but you can get really good at that if you're into that, but you might not see the whole full spectrum of conditions anymore. Once you, um, kind of hyper-focus like that. In residency, you're just in choosing a certain specialty. Do you see personalities drifting together? Like, what do you say people who choose a certain specialty often have a similar personality characteristics? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes and no. I was just dealing with a neurologist today who was really grinding my gears, but some of that person's colleagues are like my best buds. <laughs> so it's hard to, it's hard to, um, kind of delineate that but um yeah i mean expose yourself expose yourself like that's it um there's really no other way to do it than exposing yourself to all the different fields so right now try to pick one or two specialties if you're a pre-med and shadow that and then after that um you'll be exposed to everything in medical school Speaking of medical school, what, what should you look for in a medical school? Like on the topic of personality, should you look for your fit, your, your, your fit in terms of personality um, when you're going to that interview? Although you don't really have too much time to determine that, uh, being that it's usually a one day thing. Um, what other factors should you also look into? Um... I think location, if there's anything I could say, it's, it's just location, um, knowing what your, um, your lifestyle is going to be like outside of the hospital. Um, cause once you're in that hospital, you're going to get the same experience basically everywhere. But once you're out, that's where you got to live. That's where you got to interact with people. So I learned a lesson that I'm in like a more of a suburban area. I used to live in a city and I really have missed the city the entire time I've been here. So if you have that luxury of choice and you have multiple schools that want you great, if multiple schools don't want you, you can't be picky. You got to kind of just go wherever you go. So. That is true. That's, that's how medical school admissions usually go. Another student asks about the differences between being a PA and a doctor. Could you go through those for us? Yeah. So um, a doctor, you've got to do four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, and then three to five years of residency. So you're looking at eight plus, what is that, 11 years, um, 13 years, 11 to 13 years. Um, it's a long time. And if you do fellowships, even more, I'm going to do 15 years before I graduate, 15 years. PA has to do four years of undergrad and then two and a half years of PA school, and then they can work wherever they want and they can move around. The only problem with being a PA is you're never, you do a lot of the things a doctor does, but you, a lot of times you're not making that decision, that final, final decision. Sometimes PAs make their own decisions and that's fine. Um, but the big time decisions ultimately always go back to the doctor. So if you are okay with that and you just kind of want a little bit of exposure to medicine and you don't care about um, having some form of control over what happens to the patient, um, then that's a good path for you. But, um, I would say there's a lot of benefits to being a PA. It's that you can move around from specialty to specialty. You don't have to just do internal medicine, pediatrics, like I'm doing. You can be an orthopedics one year and you can be a gynecologist another year. You can be a neurologist another year. You can be a surgeon the other year. I mean, you can keep moving around. Generally speaking, PA stick with one specialty, but, um, uh, you're never going to be at the top of your field because there's always going to be doctors ahead of you. So that's just something you have to deal with. But I respect my PA peers and I think that they're all great and they're trustworthy. And um, I work with a great one right now uh, who I really like as a person too. Um, and I think that PA is because they've actually lived their life. They have a lot better social skills and they can interact with their patients a lot better. What about between nurse practitioners and PAs? Are there many differences between them or are they around the same conditions? 
I would say nurse practitioner uh, can practice on their own in a lot of realms so that they do have an extra kick, but I would say you still have to do, I think nurse practitioner school is three to four years. So it's a little bit longer than PA. Um, if you were to get a bachelor's in nursing right out of high school, if not, then you're looking at another like six years, four or five, six years. So it's more time, but you get more autonomy as an NP, at least um, in the outpatient setting. Um, and again, you can move from different specialties in that as well. But not as much, actually. It's usually like family, pediatrics. I think that's it. Family or pediatrics or adult. So you kind of do have to stick in this, a realm of patients, but um, more autonomy. So they each have their own kind of benefits. It's true. I usually see nurse practitioners in those settings, like you mentioned. PAs can expand a little outside of that in terms of specialty. Mm -hmm. Another student asks about the transition from undergrad to medical school. They also ask about any medical school interview tips that you have. I know Honestly, first year of medical school is very similar to undergrad. It's like a combination of all your four years. It's almost like a review of everything you've learned. So it's not too bad. Um, I would say going into second through fourth year, first to second year, I should say, is like the toughest transition because you're getting into more clinical organ stuff, new information. And then as far as tips for interviewing, I think I kind of covered that before. Um, we're just practicing your interviewing skills and um, just learning the basic interview questions. You mentioned the importance of being able to communicate effectively to others and just having generally good people skills, because in the end, those are who patients um, will be at the end of the day, other people. A student asks, with that in mind, do you think tutoring is a good extracurricular to put on an application? Are there any other ex extracurriculars that will allow you to get yourself out there um, that you would recommend? Yeah, tutoring is awesome um, because not only are you teaching the material and being a doctor is really about being a teacher to your patients and to other doctors and learners. But um, you're reviewing the material for yourself, too, which is really good. You're solidifying that material in your brain. Um, so hopefully I would uh, you know, recommend you to your medical, biology, chemistry, physics types fields. That's what I did, at least. Um, other fields that can get you involved is like being like an EMT. Uh, you get good knowledge. Paramedic, you get good knowledge of, uh, you know, triaging a patient. Um, you could be a scribe in an ER, which I highly recommend. I would have been a scribe in an ER. I didn't know it was a thing. Um, those are some of the top ones I recommend. And speaking of extracurriculars, you were involved as a counselor at a camp, right? Hmm. Can you talk a little more about that experience? Yeah. Um, so I'm a type 1 diabetic. I've been so for like 17 years or something like that. I forget the, the time period. But... Uh, I've been in a diabetes camp since I was a kid and, uh, for a long time, I was, a, a counselor and a staff member in one of them. And, um, it was for kids like who I was, who had type one diabetes. We all tested our blood together, uh, gave insulin, uh, together and kind of just had a nice feeling of not being alone for the first time. Cause in a lot of spots in the world outside of camp, we are alone and a kind of the diabetic of the school or our class. So it was a really special thing to be in a place where everyone's diabetic. So um, that was a really cool experience. Um, but I think it's also very similar to just being in camp in general and being a camper um, in general, being away from your family, learning how to be comfortable with yourself and comfortable away from your family and um, kind of building yourself up and your personality up as your own person. So highly recommend working at a camp if you haven't done so already. In terms of your connections, personal life-wise, do you often surround yourself by people who are also involved in medicine or does it not really make a difference for you? Uh, I think just by proximity, all your friends end up being in medicine. My girlfriend's a nurse who I met in the hospital. All my good friends are doctors who I've met in the hospital. Do I have friends outside of the hospital? Sure, but it's, it's been a really long time since I've met somebody who's not in the medical field. So um, yeah, I think uh, 
Yeah, you kind of just birds flock together. Birds of what is it? Birds of a certain feather flock together. I think that is That's pretty much it. So uh, you all kind of been through a similar process, and um, you all understand each other, and uh, you've had a long day, and you just want to go out and have good good time together and let off some steam. In terms of research, we haven't touched on the topic much. Um, now being a resident, I'm sure that it, it seems to have that staircase of uh, importance. Going from undergrad, it's not necessarily something that you need, but it's great on your application. Kind of the same in medical school, like you mentioned, having a poster is usually what they would like to see. But residency, I'm sure it, that becomes more of a standard, more of a common occurrence. Is it something that you've involved yourself in a lot within the specialty? Um, do other specialties have just further involvement in research for different reasons? I think it's up to you. Once you're a resident, it's really up to you what you want to do. If you want to go to a fellowship, then yeah, you have to publish and show your interest in the field, uh, which I've done because I'm applying to a fellowships. But, um, you know, uh, I would say that uh, for the most part, like if you publish one paper as a resident, that's it's pretty good. I think most people don't. So it's very tough. The whole field is very tough and very involved. So um, it's hard to expect you to be publishing like a machine. I think you really do that later on in your career when you're more, um, uh, I don't know, developed and um, you're kind of more grounded in the field. So I would say, yeah, maybe one paper in residency in four years, you're pretty good. You get an abstract in, you get a poster, then you're pretty good. We see a lot of people taking gap years. That's more so of a trend um, nowadays. But before I cover that, I wanted to ask about the idea of gap years for residents. Is there such a thing as a resident going out of training, maybe practicing a bit within the general specialty? Like let's say, for example, they practice within pediatrics, they establish their own practice. And then after, let's say three years, they go back to a fellowship. Is that something that would be a wise move or is it more so from one to another. There's not really many gap years that people take going from residency to fellowship. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. I'd say generally speaking, most people just go right from step to step, but you can take gap years. It's, it's, that's totally fine, yeah. Um, just depends on what is important to you. And I don't know, maybe you wanna make some money for the first time after you graduate residency before you go back into another year of slavery, basically. It's not slavery, but in the sense that you're just not getting paid, I think what is deserved of all the work you do. Um, but um, that's a that's a bigger political issue, <laughs> what medical residents should be paid. But um, yeah. All right. Um, well, that's all the questions that we have in the chat. Do you have any last tips for students listening? Yeah, I mean, you know, thanks so much all for listening. For those of you who have hung on for the last few minutes and for those of you who are gonna be watching this as a recording, uh, thanks to Michael and Mary for having me on Hearts for Health. But um, yeah, you know, just there's a lot more to life than being a doctor. So just don't be too hard on yourselves. Don't let everyone pressure you. Don't pressure yourself too much. You know, try your best, but just live your life um, and enjoy life. It's a beautiful thing to enjoy. And I think a lot of us forget about that because we get so enveloped in this path um but i hope all of you you know your dreams come true whether that's being a doctor a pa an np a tech an emt a paramedic whatever it may be and um just know that whatever you do and you end up doing it's important because it's important to you um so thanks again for having me and uh, i wish you guys all the best of luck okay yeah before i go i'm just going to show you my dog zeus because he's really cute all right that's zeus Zeus. Oh, that's Zeus. All right. That's what's important to me. Okay. That's what's important to me. And my girlfriend Liz over here, who's been watching this entire time. So remember what's important to you. Okay. There's more to life than just studying. So best of luck, everyone. Thank you. I do have a few reminders just before we end for those listening in. Um, like I said, we do have a quiz. So for those who want to earn credit for attendance, you must pass that quiz and to, to uh, get that attendance um, documented, we have a certificate. So that quiz is now posted in the chat box and it's also available on our website under the virtual shouting page. 
If you just scroll down a bit, you go on uh, to our virtual shadowing page and you'll see shadowing quiz Dr. Grossman. Click onto that and it's a Google form to pass. You have to have at least 60% or above. That quiz will be due next week at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time on this upcoming Wednesday, August 10th. After that, passing that quiz, you'll receive your certificate to the inbox of the email that you list. If you don't receive it, just in case, please check your spam folder or send us over an email and we can track it down for you. For our next shadowing session, like I said, we usually go around the Monday, Thursday schedule. So our next one will be on Monday with Dr. Wheeler for cosmetic and general dentistry. We've opened up shadowing sessions this summer and we'll continue on the same trend later in the fall to medicine, dentistry, and PA. Um, we are opening it up to more pro professions so that more pre-health students are able to join in. That session, like always, will be at 7 p.m. Central, again, on Monday, August 8th, next week. For those who want to stay tuned, again, those two ways, follow us on Instagram and join our listserv. If you have any questions, feel free to email us. But other than that, I just wanted to say thank you so much again, Dr. Grossman, for joining us. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with him, do you mind sharing your handle again? I think it's on mute. Yeah, it's it's Jeremy Grossman underscore. Um, and I post a lot of my like cases that I see online too. So uh, if you guys want to follow along and enjoy the fun medical journey, feel free to do so as well. Sounds good. All right. Well, hope everyone enjoys.